and all obstacles that we had. So let me let me actually start the panel. So the energy independence of Ukraine or independence of Ukrainian energy sector. So I'll represent the speakers. I'll introduce the speakers and uh, Minister of Energy and Environmental Protection of Ukraine, Alexei Orzhel, President and CEO, Grid Solutions at G Renewable Energy from CIS region, Gerhard Selink. Head of Integrated Gas Business of Naftagaz Ukraine, Andrew Favorov. Attorney, Managing and Founding Partner at Artsinger, Timur Bondarev. Acting Chairman of the Executive Board at NPC Ukrenergo, Energy Company in Ukraine, Pseveled Kovalchuk, and CEO of the Tech Holding Company in the Energy Sector in Ukraine, Maxim Timchenko. So, a small technical detail, just Excuse me for that. So uh, just a brief three minute speech as a moderator for us to actually set the pattern of the discussion and we'll talk I'll underline we'll talk about this part of the energy policy and energy reality is energy independence. So basically this is one of the key notions and definitions of the energy policy and the general approach is the its interpretation of the economy's self sustainment. So depend independence from the import and we understand that from the standpoint of the policy of energy policy energy independence is a little bit more extended definition so if take the current strategy of uh, energy strategy of ukraine adopted by the cabinet of Minister ministers of ukraine in 2017 five kpis are there it's a little bit more extended around this formula around the necessity of its extension and revision when you speak about the new vision of energy policy and energy independence which will be will maybe will potentially be proposed by the new minister by the new government we will talk about this today speaking about the area specificity taking this into account and the professional knowledge and expertise of each of the representatives so briefly just for everybody to understand what energy independence is uh, in the current strategy, five KPIs. Integration with the continental part of European electric network, import from Russian Federation, share of one importer, so dependence, energy dependence in all areas, and the level of integration of five KPIs are there in the strategy, in the energy strategy, and it will be revised, I guess. The energy strategy, the current one, actually offers three, three drivers three drivers to extend or expand the energy independence so energy efficiency and energy savings so increasing the gas extraction and the alternative energy or renewable energy so the first issue general issue the first question to all the speakers and I think each speaker will actually present his own vision at his own level from his own standpoint a professional individual so what is energy independence in Ukraine today how actually important this parameter how important this parameter is for the energy policy and the state policy that we have today and uh, what was our key mistake? What was our what was the biggest current mistake and why these five KPIs in the energy independence strategy that are put there are not implemented. So they give us no result. So when it comes to renewables, share in the balance of energy production and so on. So why doesn't it work? Just to have this panel in constructive and truly positive attitude to understand correctly the current situation, how which leverage to use to affect it. And just to finish, when we finish, what should be done for this very important parameter, for this very important indicator, only to strengthen and to increase? So, Mr. Minister, dear Minister, please, Mr. Urzel, I'd like you to open the panel. The word is, the floor is yours, please. So everything, everything is there. Yeah, it's working. So good afternoon, dear ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for this introduction. And uh, something already works. I'll give you an interesting figure. In September, we've had two hours in the structure of balance. 14% 14 per 14 of an electric balance. We already uh, complied with the KPIs that were in the energy strategies. So 14% of renewables. But 
correct position. We will change the energy strategy. So actually the energy strategy that we have today is actually the strategy which is on the paper and it does not comply the reality with the com with the reality that we have the de facto situation what is important it is important that the ministry is new it's it transformed we have a new logic of development because we joined energy and environment in one ministry it's i think a huge evolutionary step for Ukraine. It's, it's a new step. When we actually set those requirements which were put aside for quite a long time and when we finally will stop these conflicts on the decision-making level when in the cabinet of ministers we usually had environmentalists and energy representatives in a conflict. So yes, decisions must be made taking into account the uh, Law, the elements of the KPI development, development based on KPIs. So right now we have the energy panel, so we'll speak more about energy. And I'd like to draw your attention, I'd like draw your attention that the uh, environmental factor for each kilowatt, for each piece of energy, for each item of energy that we produce must be taken more serious because we have the climate change, it's reality. And there are factors basically which affect the real price of each unit that we produce. And if we speak about energy security and independence, we connect these two things and we need to talk about environment as well. So talking about energy independence, we also need to mention three key elements that that are actually put in the new governmental program. So three elements which would actually create the foundation of the new strategy. Yes, the government thinks about the importance of diversification, maximum diversification of energy resource supply to Ukraine. Also, there is logic present that we cannot have more than 30% of resources, supply resources from one source actually these cannot be given taken from one source and for nuclear fuel not more than 51 percent to be supplied from one source one energy source so also what is important three areas that must ensure the energy independence basically extraction and production so we can say that today Ukraine does not use the resources that we have the reserve comparing to European uh, or even world figures or statistics Ukraine uh, extracts approximately one 0.2, 1.4 out of all the reserves that we have confirmed resource comparing to other countries, developed countries, like 4 or 5 percent. And uh, this is quite a low figure and we depend on import. We need to remember about that. So another important element is the development. So as a result of our own extraction, gas generation, which is much more environmentally friendly, also renewable energy development and accumulating capacity. So simultaneously, we speak about the nuclear fuel expiry date extension. So uh, this is our Soviet heritage and we need to use it very carefully and safely. So. With this logic, yes, we need to rewrite the strategy, uh, again, taking into account that in the new ministry, we already have the new deputy, which will, who will be responsible for writing the strategy, first the concept that will present. It's important that in the concept, we will already install in each unit, and I think that we will vote for the draft law that for each energy unit will already uh, the the carbon price for the energy unit production already be there in the price of each energy unit simply to define what the real cost of the product is because why, why is it so important right now and why it is timely because our European partners and neighbors they talk uh, about the change of let's say power and change of different waves in the European Commission they simply cannot import con uh, import resources from the states which do not include that price so strict requirements strict ec uh, ecological environments strict ecological requirements and uh, of course some taxes will be imposed on the products which do not comply with the requirements and another restrictions 
if we do uh, present these new norms and standards, it means that we uh, become civilized, that we enter the civilized dimension, finally that we actually become the pro-European country, so uh, we will not have the restrictions, we will not have those taxes imposed and duties imposed, especially, and, and also the environmental externals. So three areas that we already have in the governmental program, so the new strategy that will not be only on paper, but will also uh, will make it more dynamic, it will be a model. We need clearly to identify what will be the price of energy mix, so in one year and five years and we need to provide full information to the future business who intends to develop uh, the energy sector in Ukraine that energy will have that specific price energy item. We need to explain our consumers what basically the price will be for the energy products and uh, how w will this price include echo expenses and uh, shall we decrease these expenses in each unit for w which is actually a supply to uh, actual uh, to, to each consumer in Ukraine. So these are the areas that are defined by the ministry and soon we'll uh, actually present the new concept. It's important for us to communicate not only with uh, not only within the Ukraine but also to communicate with our neighbors. Also, I'd like to tell that in operational tasks we also are stay very active with our operational task. You all heard about trilateral negotiations for Ukraine. It's the utmost priority to uh, save the uh, energy transportation through our territory. So long-term agreement with clear gas amount transportation volume. So uh, this is also the consistent profit from the use of infrastructure, energy infrastructure, and also use of gas and stability in the European market and lower prices. So I'd like to confirm also that within the framework of Ukrainian development, within the framework of the tasks that we define for us, Ukraine is becoming, will become more and more independent. Speaking about the energy sector, even if, again, we have certain disproportion in the market, we will try to do everything to avoid them, to eliminate them, and the important factor uh, a complicated, let's say, political factor, but me to mention this, what is important for us, we speak at this expert level, we need to start talking frankly with Ukrainians, as President says, we need to tell the truth, energy markets must be efficient, uh, there must be no distortions, absolute distortions created by uh, which we have at the electric energy market or gas market when we have different prices for electric energy or different gas prices, it gives an opportunity to abuse. Some certain power abuse and corruption is there. So equal rights, competitive conditions, equal prices, uh, no distortions at market. This is the priority that basically is mentioned all the time by the president. So these are the priorities set. Thank you. Thank you. Very clear. Very clear. So, Mr. Serling, Mr. Serling, do you hear us? Do you hear us? Okay. Uh, from the point of view of your company and from the point of view of your industrial experience and expertise, uh, what do you think? Uh, what challenges and opportunities do we have now as a country? as a player on the global or at least European market of energy, mm -hmm. what are the main challenges and opportunities? Okay, thank you very much. Uh, maybe starting would like to say that I'm not representing only General Electric here, uh, as I'm also president of the European Association of the T&D Industry. I speak on behalf of all the European T&D industry here at this forum and many thanks for your uh, invitation. Energy independence uh, clearly asks for a very strong uh, energy system and an energy system is very complex. 
and electricity will for sure play a very strong role in this. And I think what is very important to understand is that whatever is the electricity mix in the production, and which is logically going to, the, to more renewables, needs a very, very strong and intelligent electrical grid, which allows, which is the enabler to implement all the energy policy that you want to have uh, in a country. Uh, today we see here in uh, Ukraine a lot of strong uh, investments and uh, really personally we have here also will speak Mr. Kovalchuk from uh, Ukrainergo. Uh, Ukrainergo is doing really a, a wonderful job of running this uh, electrical grid. We are very impressed on this and has started a very strong action of uh, modernization of this uh, grid. And I think here is the real opportunity, is to continue this uh, modernization. But uh, where to go? And here uh, I want to talk about Europe, and also I know that the goal in uh, Ukraine is also to be really integrated with this electricity grid to the whole European electricity grid, become member of ENSUE, which is the association of the European uh, utilities. So for this, I think we have to keep in mind what are the goals of the European community on the electricity policy. And here it's really to understand what is in the European Green Package, which is the the document which summarizes all the strategy and which is the basis for the actions of ENSUI with all the electric grids. And the most important points in there for the electrical grid is a the will of decarbonize the energy system and the decarbonization of the energy system has a very strong impact on the electricity grid because it needs a much stronger ability to integrate renewable energies. And with this, we come to the second point of it, is the digitalization of the grid by making the grid much more digital down from the level of the equipment to the electrical substations and the countrywide control rooms. Uh, you get the technologies which allow to increase the number of renewables and still have all the intelligence to keep this grid very stable because the, the, what everybody has to have in mind, the difficult task of every utility like, in, like uh, Ukrainergo and all others is to keep at every moment the balance between load and production in the grid and this is a very complicated task especially if the energy mix becomes very complicated with renewables which are less uh, predictable than other uh, energy uh, sources. And last but not least, very important point in the European uh, uh, procedure is the interconnection. And also here, I think there will be big opportunities of Ukraine to create more interconnection opportunities in the future to have a stronger exchange of energy, both selling and buying, of uh, electricity with the other European. In the goals of the European community, every country should develop till 2030 a minimum of 15% of interconnection capacity, 15% of the installed capacity in the country. And this allows to create then a real open energy market within the European community and Europe in general and gives a lot of cost reduction. Just maybe one example here. After four years, the interconnection between France and Spain, which was built some years ago, this only single interconnection brought some 500 million euro of cost reductions in the first four years. So it's very significant because it allows everybody to have access to the cheapest energy at a certain moment. And it allows also to have a much more stability of the availability of uh, energy. And well, this helps then also every country in his energy independence. Okay, 
thank you and we'll continue to discuss all these points during our panel, I hope. Andrei. Andrew, so thank you, thank you colleagues for this forum, for opportunity to uh, actually present myself here. When I found out what the topic is, I actually wanted to talk about energy independence, but then I decided to talk about lemons. So, um, so you know, it's it's pretty logical, you know. It's the best way, actually, to uh, the the best moment to plant lemon trees was five years ago. The second best moment is now. Okay, so why actually wh what I bring you to in the discussion? Okay, so what is what is the point? <laughs> if I mention lemon trees, this is how Ukrainian energy lemon energy independence looks like. This is actually how those. Uh, lemon uh, resource spots that work so we've been pushing these spots so hard something even drops and we so we, we, we push these lemons we try even to have extraction of at the same level 80 percent 80 percent of exhaustion 80 percent average in average 80 percent of exhaustion and state companies who could guess extraction 80% of exhaustion of the resource base. So we want to have this. We can press lemon juice and we can press a lot of gas out of this. But just to have this, five years ago, this tree had to be planted. We did not do that. Um, nobody, nobody, no, any private company did not actually have any transparent clear mechanism to get the license on how to plant the tree and how to grow the lemon so we actually stand for and we do support the initiatives of the new cabinet of ministers because they want to change this approach we say yes because Within the last 12 months, we've had more auctions for the resource bases uh, and for the spots if we accumulate uh, the, the number of auctions within the last five years. The trees planted, but again, three or four years for the tree to give this kind of fruit. Unfortunately, this is a fact. So before that, Prior to that, we need to press efficiently and something's, something drops out of the lemon, but there will be no breakthrough. And uh, maybe this is quite unpleasant to know, but within the following three or four years, we will not change the situation dramatically. The tree must grow. It must be prepared. So this is the first component. Second component strategy must be economically feasible so it, it, it must be actually adequate we don't need these cubes of gas we need money a lot of money to get the gas to get the specific amount of gas imported or extracted in ukraine but it must be feasible from the economic point of view for private companies that work with that and both for state company that works for its shareholders, I mean for the citizens of the country. And I am sure that this aim will able to achieve that in three years on such a conference. We'll still be here and we'll tell that, okay, we actually supply ourselves with a nice amount of gas, but please, we need to pave the way. Thank you for your attention. So thank you. Uh, I must say that as a person who worked for 15 years in Nakhnevtegas and actually in gas extraction area and oil extraction area, I just say that yes, the strategy becomes more realistic. So when we have these conflicts in uh, gas and oil industry, it comes, it brings us only extra expenses. So we are all the stakeholders of the strategy of energy independence. It's our key. It's our main KPI. It's not just the politician's task and the state company task. So we need to have a transition. We need to understand that this is our general uh, common KPI that I want to say the contribution to energy independence stipulates loads of invest investment. Investment is the key to everything. Timur, so your understanding of how 
the Ukrainian energy sector, how, how it looks like, is it transparent, is it accessible, what was wrong, What were, where were the mistakes, where we are when we speak about investment climate, which should become the foundation uh, for actually generating the solutions for the problems. Thank you. Thank you, Alexei. Uh, well, I'm grateful to the organizers of the forum. For me, it's always a big honor to be present at such events. And uh, last year, I uh, took part in the panel uh, dedicated to agriculture. So the sector or the area that is considered by many investors or officials as the driver of the Ukrainian economy. Today, I'm uh, also a participant of such an important uh, panel uh, dedicated to energy independence. It's important to have a stable and safe energy sector. We understand that energy dependence, of course, is the foundation for the geopolitical safety of the country first. And we all know what happened a couple of years ago. We actually know that the state was so much dependent on our neighbor. And I truly am truly happy because we have the changes today in Ukraine for the recent changes that we've had. But the only thing, the only issue that comes to my mind uh, is that we need to actually have the clear definition of what independence is, energy independence is, what is energy security. And for me, as for a lawyer, for a practitioner, energy independence and, and safety, energy safety is openness of market to investment. This is what it is. Uh, th this is what it is. And uh, Ukraine is really lucky. Uh, we are the former USSR aid, or as I say, the, or the, the former Soviet Reich country. So we've inherited resources, we've inherited uh, a lot of potential. And I think Ukraine, let's say, I, I don't think I exaggerate, Ukraine has one of the biggest capacities, energy capacities in the world. But on the other hand, we do understand that we cannot stop at this specific moment, we need to involve investment, foreign investment. We need to involve technologies, use technologies, and we need to attract finance from broad uh, foreign capital markets. And uh, in this sense, I can say that there's a lot of positive we do have because we constantly work with foreign investors. We actually uh, support the agreement uh, conclusion with other countries when you work with Ukrainian investors and for me it's there's always a huge contrast I see the contrast when it comes to openness how open Ukraine for investment is is for investment despite the opinion that we have sometimes populists say so Ukraine has a lot of problems investors have no opportunity to bring the money here okay friends please if you try at least invest in energy sector in the u.s in russia in europe in china you would understand what open and closed market is ukrainian market is truly open uh, meaning that any asset today that is at the market private asset or state asset municipal asset if it's if it's if there's no prohibition for privatization and if it's not a strategic object or asset so basically um, any object can change the owner so you can actually buy it so you can organize the concession and you can just uh, I, I, I or lease agreement. I always characterize our state positively because lawyers, we are. We, we need to actually advertise the country. We need to tell what's going on in the country. We need to be the ambassadors, and quite often, people trust us more than officials. Again, uh, it's really cool that we're so open for the investment. But again, if we take a closer look at the market today, foreign investment in energy sector, unfortunately, the share is too low. Why? The question is, and uh, we, our eternal problems, what they are. Ukraine is characterized usually with corruption, lack of regulation, 
in the judiciary system, in law enforcement system, if you speak about law enforcement, if you speak about the energy sector, we have this inter interesting discussion within the market uh, about the alternative or green energy. I do hope that we'll have some positive outcomes for investors, but what I actually get from the recent discussions that we talk about theoretical opportunity to cut the green tariff, the retrospective cut of green tariff, for me, this looks like um, a, a nightmare because this contradicts any standards or principles of international law. Uh, I'm a big patriot. I'm a huge patriot of Ukraine. Ukraine has always been a very active player uh, at international law and international private law environment. And Ukraine was even a republic of the Soviet Union. And it was the first republic who signed very important international conventions on uh, international arbitrary, internet protection of investments. And Ukraine today has one of the biggest networks of bilateral agreements on protection and promotion of investment. So if we take a closer look at other countries, nobody invents anything. So many countries already uh, have gone through this issue with green energy. So they tried to cut the green tariffs or try to change the rules for investors in some way. They've been playing with that and we have their arbitrary decisions that came into force, but it's not the problem that the, it's not the problem of the money that can be taken from Ukraine. The problem is that we lose a reputation. It's not about the money. So many investors prior to investment, they say, okay, Ukraine right now has a couple of arbitrary uh, disputes. So there's information published, public information. So and they will actually have some doubts about whether it's worth giving money to Ukraine. So it's not only about investors or initiators of the projects for people who take the responsibility, who trust the state, we understand that every big investment project, there's always someone behind that, a bank or capital market. We don't talk about specific individual or company who invests in the asset. We speak about the whole industry which entrusts money to our country. In many cases, this is private private equity fund uh, that manages the money, controls the money of private depositors from many countries. So we do not talk that some specific bank or investment fund lost the money. The money are always lost by thousands of depositors, individual depositors, institutions, organizations. So. An individual elsewhere in Australia or America or the U.S. finds out about this specific thing. So well, this is the problem of individuals uh, or companies. I'm a big patriot. I think Ukraine has perspectives, has potential. We need to be very predictable because competitiveness is high at the market. And trust me, invest. if, one, if you want investors to invest, uh, we need to ask ourselves who needs whom. Quite often we hear this rhetoric like, if you make money in Ukraine, you need to use our rules. No, friends, we have a strategy. As I heard, we want to increase, for example, we speak about green energy, we want to increase the amount of energy. And there is an issue, who needs who more? So we need investors to actually uh, tackle with the commitments. Uh, yeah, so just to resume, so all the issues that were mentioned by you, the risks, of uh, rapid changes in the strategy. This is the issue of strategic development process. You cannot try the strategy from the scratch because there is no scratch, there is no blank sheet. We don't have it. And I think that the team that came to the ministry uh, will tackle that, will cope with that, and the risks that were mentioned by you will uh, all be considered and eliminated. So right now we go to the topic of infrastructure. Mr. Sevalod, the infrastructure is actually the basis, the foundation, basic element, the base element of the energy sector, which must be a fundamental part of any strategy, fundamental part of any program, development program. Where are we now? What? is already done and uh, which challenges are there and which solutions are there. 
What actually do you see in your future, in your area? Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for this opportunity to present myself. Infrastructure, as you mentioned very correctly, is the backbone or the vessel network and uh, the body is built around that economic body of every state. So if we take a closer look at other infrastructural objects of our country, roads, railways, quite often we can see a lot of criticism. A lot of critique there is from the consumers, users of the infrastructure, citizens, a lot from investors. They criticize it also because if the infrastructure is poorly developed, we lose certain competitive uh, advantages, geographical location, low price of resources, if we do have them. So if all these economic invest and advantages for investors are lost with bad roads, with uh, problems in logistics, losses in electric energy consumption. So electric energy system, yes, it's built around the uh, general network that is under the responsibility of Ukraine, but it's not but it's not limited to that so the in energy independence issue in this prism it's not only about the uh, main network to actually uh, to to actually eliminate some bottlenecks and to get give some free access but it's very important yes in the ratings of business of doing business for example many people uh, tend to quote it we can see that the problem uh, with connection to the network it actually um, brings the attractiveness of ukraine to investors down but it's about the distribution networks because this is the infrastructure that the business works with not with the uh, actually transportation network but our infrastructure object is uh, intended it has this aim for providing with the special capacity for the new players who are going to invest or already are investing in the electric energy objects to have an opportunity with no obstacles to be connected to the network and for us to ensure if we can potentially the free exchange with electric energy with neighboring states. So I'd like to say that in the world there are so many countries actually who mm, who would never even comply with the criteria of our electric energy strategy, like island countries who have no connections. Uh, if we speak about electric energy with networks of other countries, they are not connected to them. We can have even countries which are not, uh, not even these um, uh, Dejuiced lemon, lemons, yes, that, that were shown by the colleague, but still they have diversified sources of energy supply. Energy independence is a little bit more broader definition. It depends on whether is what well, does country have its own energy resource if it's much more expensive to produce it than to import. So the availability uh, of this uh, energy uh, resource is not an advantage. So Ukrainian coal, we do have it, but for such a long time, it's still even more expensive than something that is produced and coal that is produced in another country. So what is independence? To produce our own coal, extract our own coal or normal developed market, which allows us to buy freely in high competitive environment coal from countries from other countries. The same thing goes for electricity. There are so many countries uh, with deficit of energy, but still they have diversified uh, electric energy supply sources through interconnectors, developed interconnectors, and it was mentioned already, this is one of the biggest KPIs for the European countries to extend the interconnection capacity. France was mentioned interconnector with Spain. Yes, they do have it. So if we take a closer look at France uh, in 2019, so they have, uh, they produce more nuclear, uh, they produce more electric energy nuclear power stations than they consume. So if we can see these huge periods of time when France is importing electric energy in different moments of time, in different periods, different prices, in different zones, in different countries. So the better the interconnectors are developed, the better the infrastructure is developed, the more opportunities are there to get electric energy source at the best price. It's, 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 it's a better solution for economy. So if we just isolate everything, conserve everything and say we need to have only our own energy, 
will have the same problem as we had. We already depend. We already depend on the owners of electric assets and resources in our country. And believe me, we even can have worse dependence. It's sometimes worth to depend on your own countries and the task of institutions like ours and state bodies. And we speak about the Ministry of Energy and Environment, of course, to ensure this free access. How can we do it at electric energy market? We already mentioned that among the priorities, quite fairly, is the integration to continental network, European network. So what we have today, 95% of ener electric energy market. Uh, Ukrainian market is integrated in Russian Federation. Can we have open market with Russia? No. Not because we have Russian aggression in, the, in eastern Ukraine, because Russia is killing our people and occupies their territory. We cannot do this because we have different legislative uh, environment, different legislation. We cannot have open market with this legislation that we have. Ukraine has become the member of, elect, uh, of energy community. Russia, with its behavior, I don't think that it will become actually a member of that community soon. And we cannot have fully incorporated markets, fully combined markets. This is a threat for internal producers because Russian uh, energy extraction resources are much cheaper. And European market is perfect for us. We just need to actually get some technical capacity to exchange the electric energy. It was mentioned really fairly that KPIs for European systems, uh, electric energy systems, is to give certain capacity to interconnectors that connect some countries up to 50% of the internal peak load. Uh, peak load. So this is a perfect scenario if you can replace 50% with import or export 50%. So this will be an open market, normal free open market. So Ukraine right now, even right now, when we are connected with old connections, with old in-lines, with Russian Federation, Belarus and Moldova, we can cover not more than 20% of our market and we cannot even do it because we don't have proper legislation. In the first year after we synchronized with Europe, what we want to have up to 2023, according to the agreement signed in 2017, we'll have an opportunity up to 15, 16 percent of our internal market, its volume to be freely exchanged. The direction does not matter, export import. For us to increase it to 50 percent, we need to have 10, 15 years of that activity because huge infrastructure objects they are built for a long period of time these are the key challenges that we need to tackle and we need to understand that uh, in pure format energy pure electric or energy independence taking into account the balance of interest it's not about being independent from import it's not about having your own resources it's firstly it's about all investors to provide them equal opportunities, equal opportunities not limited with lobby, lobbying provisions of any laws, not limited with any influence of business group who have access to the market. Free competition is always the best way to energy independence, to any independence. And infrastructure of the transport network well, uh, we can say it's one of the best when it comes to condition and uh, comparing to other inf infrastructure objects of Ukraine, its condition is great. We've uh, invested so much during the last 10 years, as one of our big partners mentioned, with the support of in uh, international financial institutions with state guarantees, we invested almost 1 billion euros in infrastructure and another billion is planned for the next five years. Thank you. I just wanted to know that thank you. There is an index of import dependence. Eurostat calculates that for us to understand Ukrainian index of import dependence and lower than uh, in average among the European countries. So we all are basically in the same context, more or less. And as Mr. Kovalchuk mentioned fairly, it's more the structural issue than uh, the issue of full self-sustaining. Ukraine 
taking into account this, this this index of import dependence is less dependent on import of energy like Spain, Germany, Italy, Portugal, Greece, Turkey. We still feel more isolated, more restricted. So the dependence on import, the energy independence, this is still, uh, we cannot be a fully energy profit country. Only Norway, let's say, uh, is a fully uh, is a complete energy proficient country. So it's about interaction and inclusion in European network, electric energy and gas supply. And we need to understand this. So we depend on Europe as well. So Maxim, uh, Mr. Orgel, Mr. Minister, must leave the panel. So please, uh, a couple of words for you. Yes, thank you. I just need. Uh, at four, I have a meeting on the coal industry, so representatives of a coal industry. Right now, we may, uh, I think we don't have many of them today here in this hall. So, dear colleagues, one important thing to say. We can talk long about how we need to develop, where we need to go. For five previous years and before that, we talked about this. Yes, today... So... The minister took some t it took some time for the minister, but he presented the new geological service head. Cabinet of Ministers does a lot, really, right now. Many things that we need to ensure the transparency and efficiency. A lot of things are done to evaluate how efficient we were for this period of time and uh, why we look like deduced lemons and uh, why infrastructure is in such a poor condition and. Uh, why doing business indicator is not that good. So let's be frank, it's not that good, okay? So if it's not that good, we need to change ourselves and change something and then we'll find the compromise on green tariff. Right now we have a working group and uh, we clearly present all the figures, all the models there. So once more, we will be very uh, attentive to the efficiency of previous uh, governments and previous ministers. If there is a corruption, we say there is a corruption. We tell it to the market players. We tell them, please, use the rules. You have the rules. If there is a fair play, the state wins. If the state wins, you monetize. If we again try, we will try to look for other options, we will lose. Thank you for actually spending this time with us. Without you, that would be not so sufficient and so meaningful. Thank you. Let's continue. Energy independence uh, is built and reached not only by state and state companies. The tech, the biggest private investor present in all key sectors and please uh, Please, Maxim Timchenko, how hard that is. Maybe it's not hard. Is it a burden? And how do you see what is the current situation with energy independence as the biggest player, the biggest investor? What can you tell about challenges and opportunities and uh, uh, about the balance? Where is the balance of the state policy that actually makes the energy sector sustainable and uh, competitive and open but attractive to investors? And, uh, actually corresponding to the risk profile and the credit trading that our country has and uh, uh, the companies that invest in energy sector and work there. So where we are in the balance picture, thank you. Good afternoon, dear colleagues. Uh, unfortunately, Mr. Orzel will not listen to what I say, but uh, I think I'll have an opportunity to share the message. Oh, we have a stream, so don't worry. Uh, my messages are basically all the same, so they're very consistent, formal and informal. Jack Ma in the morning told that the more companies, the more problems you have. So <laughs> we can actually speak uh, about the tech in the same way, about its position in Ukraine and its status. So I, it's not like more problems, but more responsibility and something that makes our company different. Basically, we were never afraid of the responsibility. The topic of energy independence in different formats has been discussed within 15 years. The DETEC works for 15 years and we've always had these discussions. And you know, it was like a top issue for the politicians. 
But we need to do something, finally. Start doing. And it worked like within these 15 years, we started importing everything that previously we did not import. Coal, gas, nuclear, fuel, uh, energy, electric energy. Ukraine imports everything. It, is it good or bad? Is it good or bad? I have my own uh, opinion. I don't agree with Mr. Kavakchuk. But let's ask ourselves, why do we have a situation when a country with such huge resource base, natural resource base, I speak about gas, coal, availability of uranium. We have a situation when we import so actively. And the answer, in our opinion, is uh, the, the only one. So we have this immense contradiction when we discuss this story. So we're so proud that we did not buy any single unit or cube of Russian gas. But right now, we open the gate and tell, please, come to us with electric energy from Russia in unlimited amounts. So we uh, tell it to our competitors like we're fighting the monopoly. Uh, so we claim that Ukraine wants to be a leader in green energy generation. Investors, they believe, they start investing in that. And then we suddenly tell, OK, thank you for your money. But right now, we will revise the investment regime or mode. OK. <laughs> we, s we claim we need our own coal detect increased the amount of extraction twice it doubled the extraction amount and everyone else and state mines they just uh they're almost destroyed so we again they, they tell us that the tech is a monopolist okay so the quicker the faster we'll take these controversies out the more consistency we'll have in our messages in the message of authority to their citizens the more chances we have to talk about energy efficiency energy security and investment climate so everybody's convinced already that um, talking about energy independence and uh, availability of your own resources electricity gas we can talk about it only if investors will believe in the country and if they actually invest i don't believe that state companies can support that can ensure that it's just a temporary situation we all were there i i i know that there will be a moment when state companies will become public companies and give an opportunity of invest to investors uh, to become the co-shareholders and so on when we talk that we need to create a competitive market regardless of whether the product is produced i agree only if we speak about european country which is surrounded by european countries and neighbors okay how do you think dear friends russia and belarus uh, today they actually supply us with coal and electric energy is it an open transparent economy that if you want to sell energy to them are they open if i come to interrow and say okay buy some electric energy will they buy it a state company or bill energo or uh we don't have enough stories with russian gas or the situation with the coal when the ministry in russia says okay the coal will go to our electric will tell us whether the coal goes to electric stations or not lugansk station look at that russian government with its single decision actually terminated or suspended the supply of coal there and only you can bring it only from russia there so is this a competition no or again we actually make the same mistake that we've constantly been making during the 10 years so this is a message to authority please don't cover yourself with positions like you're fighting the monopolies uh like you have this quasi competition or whatever and we don't need to hope that our northern partner will allow us to create transparent economy and open economy i agree with 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 the statement that ukraine must be connected to europe we must physically be the part of european market energy market let's work in this direction please don't feed yourself with illusions that cheap russian resources will change the situation and make the prices cheaper and do something better for the economy let's start talking about messages and think about messages that we bring to Western markets. Many of you heard that DTAC actually is, uh, has green securities for 325,000 euros totally for that price. And uh, we were not 
talking about the tech. We're talking about Ukraine. We were building uh, the trust to Ukraine. And the first question, like, what do you talk about this retrospective change of the green tariff? We start. We, we wanted to mitigate the message that we had from Ukraine. We wanted to explain that yes, we have a dialogue. We have some complications. We need to reform it. We need to have auctions finally launched. Uh, quite often, in the vast majority, investors they act not only with can calculations, with specific calculations, they make decisions with their emotions, on the basis of emotions. So what emotions can we have if uh, in the country we have these controversial messages from Ukraine we get them, actually some stories, some revisions, and then investors have these collective letters signed and then they go to embassies. Let's leave it behind. We have a unique chance right now and I do agree. I, I, I I, I agree with that. We have a unique chance in our country with a young president, with young government, fresh government. Let's just um, let's just move faster through this hard process, painful process. Let's renew the strategy together with players, with those who yesterday, ten years ago, who took this risk and started investing in Ukraine, and let's implement the strategy together. Okay, so we tell that we have enough coal in Ukraine. We're ready for winter. So uh, the state officials tell, but why are we ready? We have this huge dynamics of green energy generation, thanks to what? And many other cases, many other examples. Let's start respecting and um, loving investors who are here in Ukraine, national investors, Ukrainian investors, foreign investors who invested in Ukraine uh, today, but not those who speak about future investment. And everybody will see how basically the state treats investors and only then people will understand to come or not to come. This is my vision and this is my formula of energy independence and security. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much. Very substantial, thank you. I'll just uh, like to finish with the first round of questions. And I'd like to say that the statement that we need to update the strategy, energy independence strategy. What strategy? Th th this. This is the seventh strategy already. <laughs> so I came to the gas business in um, 2003. Five years in 15 minutes uh, in 15 years. Ministers of energy, so many prime ministers. It should not be continued. I just want to say that for the following strategy, that I do hope that the state will write with stakeholders together at one table. It will be the document which will not be revised or rewritten in two years because some provisions are not applicable. I do hope and I hope that such discussions that we'll have in our offices will lead to that state will never build the energy by itself, energy sector by itself. And investors will not be able to do that. We need the balance point, the equilibrium. And only when we find it, you'll feel it. We'll have the investments increase, the reputation will actually become better. So many countries have gone through that and I do hope that we are on the way. So taking into consideration that we have a little bit more than 30 minutes or almost 20 minutes, so I'd like to have some questions from the audience if, ladies and gentlemen, you do have some. If you do, we have a microphone and uh, please. Good afternoon, Alexander Pavlovsky. I have a question to Mr. Kovalchuk. Right now we have a discussion concerning the green energy in Ukraine. So do you have a vision or even solutions? Which sources are the best to pay for the green energy to have it more sustainable and to have the balance finally? Who should be the donor? Yes, Th that is the question. <laughs> OK, very interesting question. Thank you. Uh, I want you to understand one thing. So giving this frank open answer and for this answer to be to satisfy all the members and participants. But it, we always have the story that 
when you give the answer, especially officials or petitions give answers, everybody tries to give the answer to be loved by everyone, to satisfy everyone. So it will not be that popular. And I will give you my personal opinion that if the world, in its majority, understood that we have a certain problem of global warming, we do have it, and some SDGs were defined, and there is a statement like, okay, we need to decrease the CO2 emissions and actually uh, develop the alternative energy, renewable energy. Therefore, from this logic, the most fair and most feasible thing will be that this compensation of investment should be paid by those who produce CO2 emission. So the polluters, my colleagues, my colleague on the left, coal, <laughs> those who use coal, for example. In the countries where it works, uh, the same processes actually occur that we have an investment policy of DTEC company. They try to increase their uh, profile of investment in green energy, actually to bring those green certificates to them or the taxes that are collected for emissions. So the circle is closed and they are self-stimulated to develop the renewable energy. I actually love this model so much. It's, of course, uh, not that good for the owners of the assets because it actually uh, decreases the payments to shareholders. But I think this is the best way. Uh, in Ukrainian reality, it cannot be the only one because the share uh, of the heating power generation, heating energy generation is not that high where we have, uh, it's not that high like in the countries where the mechanism works. So the population must pay for that as well. So two options, just like we have it through the tariff of system operator, because then all equally pay all consumers of electric energy or with the direct subsidy from the state budget with which we can fill it with taxes. So uh, no other option. It's just a matter of looking for the right combination. But we do not need to avoid the best option when we need to have external taxes. Those must pay that we want to get rid of. So it works right now that we mostly, mostly, the compensations are mostly paid by nuclear energy sector. And if we take a closer look from the European perspective, it looks like that Ukraine wants to get rid of nuclear energy. Uh, I think uh, we need to correct it a little bit in some way. Thank you. So, can I ask a clarifying question, Maxim, to you? So, Maxim, strategically, did you project, do you imagine or extrapolate the moment, do you think of the moment in Ukraine when green energy will finally uh, de facto uh, become the leader? When shall we stop the coal blocks? Just because their share is replaced with green energy. This picture, is it actually realistic? Shall we have this future someday? Okay, so you, as a company, uh, in your package you have coal generation and green generation. So green energy is, it's, it's aimed to replace the dirty energy, okay? So how do you see it strategically? Shall we replace it? Do you project it in the future? You know, uh, we project it. We need to, if we don't project it, we need to think about it, start thinking. And I'm so convinced that with that structure of energy sector that we have, like 55% of nuclear energy, 10% of hydro, and with the dynamics of green energy growth in Ukraine, and I speak about the strategy, we can claim that strategic goal of Ukraine is to become the leader of, in decarbonization in Eastern Europe and actually find ourselves in a situation when the so-called carbon-free economy is that something that will happen in Ukraine, something that will be there. Maybe it sounds weird from the head of the biggest coal company and heating generation company, but um, still I can say that we are the biggest company in Ukraine in green energy generation. Yes, we produce green energy. This is what we, the decision we made in 2008. 
All big companies do that. It takes months, decades, but it's a final goal, yes. And those energy companies and even oil and gas companies who don't do that, they actually come out of the sector. I think someday those will die who do not modify themselves. But not tomorrow. Please don't think that tomorrow there will be an order and uh, 20 inefficient mines will just close. No. Because we have social commitments, we have social factors, we have balance, energy market balance. No, it won't. But we need to understand, we at least need to install the mechanism in the energy strategy, uh, indicative dates, financing sources. We need to know how to support 50,000 miners. We need to set the rules. We need to set the clear rules. Like if you want to have 25% of green energy in the balance, we need to answer the question, what we do with the coal mines today and coal generation, please. Sevalot, Sevalot, you want to add something, okay? Just to clarify, okay? I also recognize that the tech reinvests mostly in renewable energy we just have a little bit different mechanism of financing of the story in ukraine uh but the issue was uh about how fast green energy will replace coal generation in ukraine okay and here i just need to give you another answer a little bit different we have right now a little bit reverse situation if you take a closer look at germany we can see that the situation is the same basically so increasing of the share of the renewable energy leads to co2 pollution increase so this situation was not mentioned by us uh so this uh it also works in ukraine reality the co2 green paradox so Basically, we have this replacement, replacement the coal, that's why, yes. This, 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 this is a separate issue, uh, the support of investment projects, yes. We also have these mechanisms, but still they don't work. I wanted to tell another thing. So this problem that actually is of huge concern from the uh, gas and oil sector, the Nord Stream 2 construction and the problem with our pipes, mostly it's connected with the increase of consumption in Germany and some other uh, European states, which mostly uh, more than 30, 40 percent with the renewable energy. So they consume more natural gas still. Why? Because wind energy, solar energy stations, they require more maneuvering uh, capacity for balance. In Ukrainian reality, we still don't have, apart from hydroelectric stations and coal electric stations, we don't have these maneuvering capaci capacities. And right now, the increase in growth of renewable energy, the short term will lead to pressure on nuclear energy generation and later it will create more pressure on coal. Just to avoid that, for the decarbonization to occur proportionally to investment in clean energy, we need to change the structure of generation. And it takes time. It's like with the lemons. In half a year, you cannot build a new object, accumulation object, or the peak load station. You need years, actually, for these objects to grow, you know, to, to appear. So Andri has a very nice presentation. We can use it everywhere, I guess. So yeah, short in short term, the more sun and when we have, the better it will be for the coal sector as well especially after we uh, restructurize the market. So, any other questions, dear colleagues? Yes, we do have a question. In the very, very end, else somewhere. Thank you. Thank you, colleague Sergei Usichenko, Epicenter Company. I have a question to Maxim. Well, first of all, congratulations with this great agreement, the first green bond in Ukraine. <laughs> it's a huge achievement, I can say. So uh, I have a question on how you attract investments to the country. So the key concerns from investors uh, on your roadshow, 
after your after the meetings with them so what actually restricts what limits their enthusiasm yes and uh, the people who are not in the book okay for the people who are not in the book not the key the key ones okay because we can actually talk on how cool we are how great we are but for reality check we just need to look at ourselves with the eyes of investor if he is like suspended from that if he has obstacles okay I also wanted to ask this drivers and destructors what is opportunities and what is barriers for instructor thank you for congratulating me uh, I do think the green bond issuance is the success of Ukraine not only of our company because we managed to create the new instrument for international markets which allows us on one hand to uh, use to bring new investment through actually issuance of bonds by other companies and it will be a benchmark and an indicator whether an invest investor is interested and the price of the capital so we've announced it for 300 million and uh, right now we stopped at 325 million but the coupon uh, 8.5 percent for the bonds so this is quite a high uh, actually figure quite a high level high rate so it's really hard to compete when you launch auctions for green energy objects construction so um, when I take the statements of some politicians due to the statements of some MPs I will not give you names I was warned okay so I, we have one active person but it took some percent it cost us a couple of percent not it, it was not just the price we paid but Ukraine paid for them that will be uh, a benchmark so this is an example the discussion on any retrospective revision of tariffs any change of rules and when this is claimed or stated by the MP or official it actually destroys the reputation of the company in Ukraine so if I answer a question what investors like investors like president <laughs> investors like young authority young parliament they like the drive that they have in the country right now and the wish to change something investors also yeah investors love the money sure but what they don't like yeah uh, they don't like these uh, statements that we have there we reform the energy market we have amendments to the law again new restrictions for the next three years uh, and actually we want to sell it where we tell we want so if we want some green investment we start telling about restructurization depressurizing okay let's be consistent and let's stick to the moment and let's work with investors who still like the authority and the president thank you very clearly Timur yes uh, a short command from the legal point of view yes we have uh, many discussions with stakeholders in this area and what the arguments I have from our officials these politicians they say okay we just talk nothing happened why our investors are crying yes they cry but uh, one interesting example we had this revolution in the market in summer we actually from July 1st uh, we launched a new market so the green tariff and the court decisions you all know that okay you know the situation we had a couple of agreements where investors and banks needed had to provide the money for green energy objects they had to give the money we had the signatures still our clients did not receive money within the agree within the signed agreements just the talks so on the basis of just the talk they just talked so banks tell we have the discomfort we are not ready to give you money so this is one example our politicians unfortunately they are not responsible they don't recognize how responsible they are that they don't speak on behalf of uh, themselves they talk on behalf of Ukraine and please if you talk your politicians be very careful with that questions so we have a couple of questions more so good afternoon my name is Artyom I'd like to ask uh, Maxim right now but first I'd like again to congratulate him because on uh, October 31st you were recognized as the biggest company 
and you've launched this solar energy station in Pokrovsk, if I'm not mistaken. So you have become number one in Ukraine, number two in Europe, taking your capacity. But what are your plans? Uh, where do you want to become number one again? <laughs> Which are your ambitious plans? Okay, so uh, Jack Ma today visited the Tech Academy. And we had an opportunity together with him just to have a small conversation, small table talk uh, about his opinion and his positions on the presidential statements that we need to invest in people. Yes, and that we really want to become number one company among the corporate universities, our academy, to be number one. We've already uh, made this step. We were recognized. But OK, um, with our plans that we have for the academy development, this is the goal, to become an educational hub, strong education platform thank you I guess the, the question good afternoon good afternoon a question to mr. Timchenko again so congratulations again <laughs> you do really a lot and the university I guess is your best project because people from this university they actually generate then even better projects so Yes, I think you have the biggest green projects, the most ambitious one. You will increase it, and we know your plans. But when D Tech will fully become green company? Yes. As for a visioner of the company, when will you uh, be an example, a flagship for the whole industry in the country? Okay. So will it happen? Thank you for these uh, for this wonderful question. This is one of our key tasks, of course, and goals. We have this long-term strategy, and we want to present it uh, for the public in 2020 to tell about the plans. And uh, the answers for all your questions, I guess, will be there for the majority. So within the next 10 years, we will not be fully green, of course. Uh, I want to be frank with you and to be sincere. Uh, first of all, uh, to actually get 25 million tons of extraction, to bring it to zero, uh, you need to transform yourself from the grassroots level. Big company has big responsibility. First of all, we are responsible for our people. More than 80,000 people in the tech. 40,000 are minors. And we will never allow ourselves to actually uh, transform something without taking their interests into account. So second thing, I fully stand uh, with your opinion about the balance uh the coal generation in the balance yes we will still have it there in 10 years coal will be present in the balance but the thing is we need to be more efficient uh with that technologies and stations that function today we need to do everything that we can for these stations to comply with the emission standards this is our task yes the volume of extraction of coal will go down in our company as well, the coal generation will go down as well. But I can't say that we will be fully, fully a known coal company in 10 years. Speaking about the strategy, colleagues, i just like to add that 10, 20, 30, 50 years for such transformations, this is a normal period, short-term fashion that we have today, short-term results, short-term goals. It does not work for energy. Energy is physics plus economy, okay? So politics cannot break the laws of physics, <laughs> the laws of universe. If there is some violation. We have populism and energy. Populism and energy is its death. So if we speak about strategy, we need to be ready, A, for a long-term horizon of planning, B, for a long view, ability to model, ability to prognose, C, we need something that is called the long will, long-term will. If you start something, continue that and complete that, regardless of not seeing the result. We cannot have fast food principle in energy sector. Next question. Thank you. Vladimir Vlasyuk. I am actually head of the consulting company and uh, I think that energy is something, our energy sector is our heritage that was left by the Soviet Union. This is like an advantage, but we cannot use this advantage to create this quantum leap, you know? But we carried out a research and we actually found out that like our energy is the cheapest, 
59 uh, kopecks per kilowatt. I Green energy gets more, but uh, the last project that is built, implemented in Turkey, they build a nuclear power station. Their tariff, if we convert it for grivnas for one nuclear kilowatt, so operational cost is 60 and more than three grivnas, this is the money that they accumulate for the future reconstruction and modernization of nuclear power stations. Because this process is really complicated, it requires huge funds. Do we have something in Ukraine? No. But we know that the resource will have colossal investment uh, demands up to 2030. Yes, we know that state policy does, does not include that. Dear panelists, what should we do with that, please, Andre? Yes, okay, I can try. I can try. As I, I brought you Ukrgazdobycha company that was sucked like lemon for 20 years, and uh, for the last 20 plus years, I've been convinced that Ukrgazdobycha is the same thing. Everybody is pressing economic uh, actually value out of this state asset, out of this company. The cheapest electric energy, the lowest expenses, no expenses are included. Uh, so nobody thinks about modernization, transformation, and we'll have the same tragic result, I guess, as we have with Ukrgaz Dobicha, where we run and try to plant the trees again to grow them. If you don't water the trees, uh, the trees die. Basically, that's the answer. So it's an important issue, and I do hope that it will stimulate big discussion at political level. From the point well, of view of global company, from the industry, it's uh, really for me as non-Ukrainian here in this panel very interesting to listen this discussion on the energy mix because. Uh, Actually, I'm Austrian, living in France, I lived also in Germany, and in all these countries the same discussion in reality would be very similar. And it's very similar because a change of energy mix is very complicated, there are a lot of constraints that it was expressed here, it's not so easy to change from one or the other, there are financial constraints, there are political constraints, a lot of things, but I think, seen from the industry, what we want is that one goal is going to the decarbonization and with this to a stronger role of the renewables. This is really a light faden in it which is not forgotten and which has to be on the long term. And the second point which was already mentioned also here, it is and it has to be a long term strategy. It's over 10, 15, 20 years that this uh, change is really managed. And this means that there has to be a clear political conviction, a regulatory conviction, and the stability of the rules to allow the investments over all these periods and to keep a direction. Then in the details between what is exactly the time of the coal, what is the time of the nuclear, what is the time of the ramp up. This is then specific to every country and the constraints in the country. But from the industry, we insist and we fight a lot that the basic strategy on this, setting long-term rules and keeping these long-term rules for investment, that they are kept stable. And I think that's also very important here in Ukraine, like in any other European country. Thank you. Еще вопросы? Есть возможность еще пару вопросов задать? Вот есть. So two questions, I guess. So two questions, I guess. We still have an opportunity because I can ask millions of questions, but unfortunately, uh, yeah. We're out of time, and I want to have some discussion as well. So good afternoon. My name is Bogdan Boyka. A question to the Minister of Energy who is left. Uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> we don't have the Minister of Energy here. Uh, I'm so sorry. Yeah. <laughs> but basically, he will answer that later. Thank you. Uh, he'll get the video. So I, I, I have a question about energy security. And um, for me, just like for many people who live in Kiev, we're so worried about this obvious thing. We have the situation when 
We have nuclear station, power station close to us. I will not mention that. And uh, some issues about security and safety are there. Previously, we had the stories, as far as I know, uh, you may correct me. The used fuel, the used nuclear fuel, the waste, we actually sent it to Russia. We paid $200 million per year just to, to actually store the, fu the used fuel. And as far as I know, we have the information. The project is planned that we'll build this nuclear burial in Kiev region where we'll store the American used fuel. OK, so what is with this project? First, I'd like to know whether we will build this burial uh, storage site. And uh, do we have a guarantee? Do Kievans, 5 million people, have this guarantee of safety, actually? Okay, if you have a lot, maybe you. The closest to you, I guess. Because our office is also in Kiev, just like everybody else have, and, uh, you know, it's really uh, important for us. I had some short experience of uh, working in Erhotom, that's why I will answer. Look, you used the word burial site, and uh, yeah, I'm sorry, but I have some associations like hundreds of animals die, mostly journalists use that word. So it's called the central storage of used nuclear fuel. So the first part is already built in Chernobyl zone, and the general contractor is American company Holtec, which is uh, specialized in construction of such objects, also in America as well. They build it. The storage of nuclear fuel in Russian Federation that you mentioned, it's the storage, temporary storage, according to agreements that were concluded previously. So this fuel, anyway, it's remnants, leftovers, after processing, had to be returned to Ukraine for final storage, final burial. And the place, we had no place to actually bury the fuel. Protected according to the standards for the Kievans and the Ukrainian citizens to feel safe. Within the territory of each nuclear uh, energy station, there is a special pool for used fuel at Zaporizhia nuclear station. Dry storage is built already with Hayat. And what we have in Chernobyl zone already built at former Chernobyl nuclear station, it's basically the same construction. Yes, there is certain equipment that may actually work with the Westinghouse fuel. And as the minister said, this is the object, the subject of the diversification. We right now have Americans and Russians who supply us with nuclear fuel. So the storage we build is the object that will allow us to store it safer than without the storage. And the expo and uh, its expiry date, <laughs> it's really, really far from November 2019. And I do hope that it will not take even one generation before it expires. So I do hope that technology will develop for us to actually extend its lifespan. So one or two questions. Okay, I'll be very fast. My name is Ksenia Ivanova, and I have a question to all the speakers. It's quite short. How do you think the energy independence in our country do we need to involve young specialists, graduates of educational establishments? Because I think that if we involve, let's say, young, fresh blood in the processes, maybe we will have some new solutions for the problem. Just a question. If, if, if possible. Yeah, sure. Uh, Fresh blood in authority. I think the new president, the new cabinet of ministers clearly stated they want to have more fresh blood. Colleagues, do you have anything to say about the mechanism of attracting young people to real processes in your companies or maybe through some uh, expert initiatives, public initiatives? Do you actually interact? Do you actually do something in that area? How can we enhance it because it's important. We all as employers say we have no fresh ideas. We need to have more ideas. We actually uh, need to educate people, involving them in processes. This will be a very good final note for us. Uh, I think it's an extremely important point. And everywhere in Europe since uh, several years now that uh, these questions about renewable energies, about energy policy has become very important and very well known. 
much more universities and people in the university are focused about this. And we need in this sector much more engineers that are interested in the technologies which are needed to develop, for example, the smart grids, the digital solutions in the energy field. So yes, it's very important to involve young people, in particular students, universities, doctor fee thesis, to find the best technologies for the future to improve all the systems which support the energy systems. And I think there was already in the last years a very positive move in the field of education in this sense. Thank you. <clears throat> um. So I will just add that NAC Naftagaz company, uh, we actively invest in this area. We have partnership with Poltava uh, Oil Extracting University, and we send our young employees for internship to Calgary, Canada. And for us, it's important. I'll just like to add, people you look at right now, uh, in future, they will be former energy sector directors, okay? So uh, we actually come to this fringe, to this edge, and your colleagues, your friends, your uh, students, you are the future. You are the future directors, okay? So we, the stake is, is not on us, it's on you, so. Uh, well, actually, we jump to another area, and uh, it really somehow touches the corporate social responsibility of the business. I think we all depend on young people and generations, and I think young generations are more concerned about environment and green energy than we do. This is something that we see in our office. We have this very active wave, active movement even, how to get rid of plastic, go green stuff, and that's it, energy saving. And we truly see that young generation wants to work in responsible companies, socially responsible companies that think about environment, think about future, so we don't have any other way, no solution, but just to invest in them and to create these clean spots around us, just to create later clean countries. Oh, such a nice question. Everybody, so much interest from people, so much enthusiasm. Thank you for this question. But the answer is in the question. We cannot survive without young people, young staff. Why? First, because tech companies, they become younger and younger. Energy is the high tech or even tech sector. So we have dynamics, very rapid dynamics, uh, sharp dynamics in high tech sector development. New competencies are required everywhere. And unfortunately, these competencies for someone, fortunately for someone, unfortunately, and well, teams become younger. Some people who are older uh, than a certain age, for them, it's really hard to adapt to digital skills. They cannot actually enhance it. Energy and IT go hand by hand. We can spend a lot of time on this discussion. And uh, actually, we've had this master's program with one of the universities developed uh, on energy and IT. But I think if just to be the last, uh, I think Mr. Timchin will be the last one to answer because the DTEC Academy is a huge achievement. So I think we can actually close it with a statement because DTEC Academy teaches people how to be efficient in energy sector, okay? So thank you, thank you for the question. I think, uh, Andre, uh, we we are still, we can still work a little bit like directors. We look like de juice lemons maybe, but we can still work, okay? So our transformation, we must become mentors and instructors for young people, but not just become former directors. So our company a couple of years ago, when we only uh, created our corporate university, our academy, we wanted to have not le uh, less than 80% of top positions in our company to be given to people who grew up in the company, to our graduates. And the path starts not from the moment the person comes to DTEC, when the person is learning at the college and university. So 
we have agreements with more than 10 universities, DTAC groups and departments working in universities. For the young people, we want to make the minors uh, and energy sector specialist professions to make it more attractive with the digital that we bring with us. We can. And then after the person graduates from the university, they have certain advantages to come to DTAC as a specialist and be employed there. And from the very first day, we, we have this continuous learning principle. When you're employed, you still learn with your basic skills and up to the top programs with the London Business School. And we really want to develop that. We do not want to limit ourselves with DTAC company. There are so many people who don't, uh, who are not in DTAC, but they also are talented. And we uh, launched this MBA flagship program in a week. So we have a lot of surprises and have very good people, very talented people. Our philosophy coincided with Jack Ma's statements that the best people in your company, the best people are in the company. So don't try to look for someone elsewhere. Grow them in your company. Grow them, nurture them. And I hope that when we are finally deduced, we'll have the generation that replaces us, OK? Yeah. So dear colleagues, thank you. Thank you. We're out of time in 30 seconds to finish as we understood the energy independence as a separate issue in energy sector is a priori a complicated one. No easy solutions, no easy ways, not so many prizes that we can get that easily. So on this stage, if just to add a couple of, basically we have all Policymakers, key policymakers here on the stage today, and we have them. We are the stakeholders of the strategy. We all are. And if we work together, if we stop uh, actually playing these dirty games, and if we all work for one result, what we're doing with some success, but we still have it. So I do hope that the seventh strategy that was announced by the Minister of Energy and Environment in September, it was announced. So it will become a real document that will allow us to have some shifts, strategic shifts. I don't want to have this uh, dusty folder number six elsewhere in the ministry. Let's help them do that. Let's be attentive, competent, constructive. Everything is in our hands. Thank you. Thank you so much. And have a nice evening.